It was the spring of 1857. I was accompanied by my husband's cousin and his bride. They intended to settle in Minneapolis, quite a small village located on the west bank of the Mississippi, opposite the city of St. Anthony. A black pioneer named Emily Gray and her family came upriver and made a home near the falls of St. Anthony. This mother and businesswoman also made a stand against slavery on the eve of the Civil War, when the Minnesota Territory was becoming the North Star State. African Americans were here during the formal territorial period. You'd find black people providing barber shops, tailors, other sorts of things that cater to personal needs, uh, personal grooming. The only job that African American men could fill that would give them the, the possibility of a, of a future in economic uh, mobility, economic, socially, was barbering. The whole spirit of civil rights was kept alive in the barbershops of St. Paul. One of these African-American barbers was Joseph Farr. Late in life, Farr recalled how this black community made up a small stop on the Underground Railroad. I think there must have been 50 or 60 colored people here in 1850, and they all were concerned in getting the slaves away from their owners. Another black barber, Ralph Gray, was working upriver in St. Anthony. In 1857, he had established his business and sent for his wife. Emily Gray's memoirs describe the journey west from Pennsylvania. We were delayed upon the road by high waters through Wisconsin. Our train was brought to a sudden stop and could proceed no further. The best of humor prevailed. Whenever could be heard the patter of rain upon the roof of the coach, it was the signal to sing a hymn or a ditty. Everyone joined in the singing. This seemed to be intended to lessen the noise of the downpour of rain as well as to chase away from our minds the gloomy reflections of separation from old homes and friends. Every person we came in contact with seemed to be doing his utmost to make it as pleasant as could be for us. Emily felt welcomed in Minnesota. Many of the area's leaders were anti-slavery. This was the time when the territory was preparing for statehood, and Minnesota's abolitionist Republicans vowed to wield the power of the new state on the side of freedom. My husband had selected a spot with a small building for us to take up our residence. Fashionable and formal visits were not much in vogue, but the good old-time neighborly calls were more generally indulged in. Suggestions in domestic economy New methods of bread making and vegetable cooking were learned. There was always some woman friend who would gladly be a guiding star to lead me out of the many little difficulties met with in all households. Local women taught her how to cook Minnesota style, and they also taught her how to sew. So it was the women here who actually led to her own seamstress business later on. She was very concerned about the institution of slavery and actually went shopping for churches that would deal with the institution of slavery, settling at last on the Congregational Church. What made this church interesting to her was the minister, Reverend Seacom. His mouth was not muzzled in the pulpit when occasion required he should speak against the national crime of American slavery. She took pride in being African American. She came from a family that was very involved in, in abolition and helping slaves uh, gain their freedom. She named her son, who would be the first black child to be born in St. Anthony, Minnesota, Toussaint Louverture, after the, the Haitian general who led the, uh, the slaves in revolt against the French. But Minnesota of the 1850s was as prejudiced as it was progressive. In 1854, St. Paul-based territorial legislators almost passed a so-called black law. The bill would have required African Americans arriving in Minnesota to post a bond of several hundred dollars to guarantee good conduct. Intolerant Northerners weren't the only problem. In the mid-1850s, Southern settlers tried but failed to establish plantations complete with slaves here in Minnesota. The area also played a role in the most important legal decision of the era. 
Two decades before Emily's arrival, a slave named Dred Scott was brought to Fort Snelling. After having spent time in the free territory, Scott sued for his freedom. In 1857, after years of court battles, he lost his case in a landmark decision. The court decided that uh, Dred Scott was not free. You are property and therefore you can't possibly be a citizen, therefore you have no rights to petition, we won't hear it. End of story. Slave masters felt because of the protection of Dred Scott that they could come to Minnesota and bring their slaves. And they were coming to Minnesota because this was a place of respite. They could get away from the summer in the South. So the free state of Minnesota was bound to the business of slave owning tourists. This tension would boil over when Christmas came to Minnesota in July. Colonel Richard Christmas traveled upriver in the summer of 1860 to the new state of Minnesota. Like most well-to-do visitors, the Mississippi planter and his family stayed at St. Anthony's Winslow House. Christmas brought along a slave named Eliza Winston. Eliza Winston got word to, to Emily Gray asking for help for freedom. Emily Gray was a woman who was willing to um, say, this is the time to act. In fact, she rode with the posse out to meet with the Christmas family and spirited Eliza Winston to court where due process was ready to free her. In a tense, packed courtroom, an abolitionist judge granted Winston her freedom. Regarding the loss of his slave, Colonel Christmas was quoted as saying, I have plenty more in Mississippi, but slavery supporting Minnesotans weren't as calm. A mob was forming. There are a lot of people here who did not like abolitionists. There are a lot of people here who did not want to see slaves freed. Winston was taken to the home of W.D. Babbitt. Abolitionist editor Jane Swisshelm offers a dramatic account of what followed. The house of William D. Babbitt in Minneapolis was surrounded from midnight until morning by a howling mob, stoning it, firing guns and pistols, attempting to force doors and windows, and only prevented gaining entrance by the solidity of the building and the bravery of its defense. Baby Toussaint and the family also came under siege when the mob stormed the Gray's home and ransacked it. So it was a very turbulent time, and for a woman to take a stand against slavery at a time where the local economy relied on the preservation of slavery, it was very, very impressive. St. Anthony was divided, and for the next several months, the residents of St. Anthony and Minneapolis, both, uh, walked around with guns. Uh, the, the, the Twin Cities were virtually on the throes of civil war. And this is ironic because just a couple months later, Civil War, in fact, would be declared. Minnesota was the first state to offer troops for the fight to preserve the Union. At the decisive victory of Gettysburg, a Minnesota infantryman captured a Virginia Confederate battle flag. Another victory followed the war. After several attempts, a referendum was finally passed, granting the right to vote to Minnesota's African Americans. This was in 1868, two years before the nation would take this step with the 15th Amendment. This Minnesota milestone was celebrated with a grand event in St. Paul, where Ralph Gray read Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Emily and Ralph continued to be quiet community leaders who delighted in the steady growth of the state's black population by the turn of the century. While Toussaint Louverture Gray died when he was a boy, the Gray's other children did well for themselves. The family's descendants are now back on the East Coast. But Emily and Ralph remained. The black pioneer couple are buried next to two of their children in Lakewood Cemetery. Oddly, the graves are unmarked, but in a way, Emily's memoir serves as a poignant epitaph to her life and times. The journal concludes with a powerful ode to the falls of St. Anthony. We never more will hear the music of the falls. Many the times in the quietness of twilight hours when I croon the lullaby over the wearied limbs and sleepy eyes of my children, I was joined in the chorus by the plaintive tones of the music of St. Anthony Falls, now gone, gone forever. 
The falls are now covered by a man-made ramp. The town of St. Anthony is now just a neighborhood in Minneapolis. Many things have changed since the dramatic events of 1860, but some things have transcended time. Despite demands from Virginia, Minnesota refused to return the captured Confederate flag. Why hold on to a tattered standard from a distant war? Maybe, by keeping it, the flag joined other symbols of the young state that was the first to enter the fight on the side of freedom and is still struggling to keep alive Emily Gray's idea of a diverse, accepting Minnesota. Civility and kindness seemed to be in the air in those good old pioneer days. There was never a moment in my life when I regretted that my feet had touched the soil of Minnesota. <laughs>